That's good. Okay, you're good to go. Well, welcome everybody. The, the miracles of technology. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I'm, I'm looking at the screen because um, most of those who have gathered for our conversation today are online. Thank you for making the time and thanks everybody for, for joining us here in Elm Bank, Coventry University. Um, those of you that don't know me, my name is Chris Shanahan. I am the team lead for our Faith and Peaceful Relations Work at the Centre. And Paul, Professor Paul Weller and I worked together for a number of years um, when Faith and Peaceful Relations was a group rather than a theme. Um, and it's really lovely to welcome you back, Paul, to share with us. Um, as many of us know, Paul is um, currently a visiting professor at the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University, and also a stipendiary research fellow at Regent's Park College at Oxford University, and a, an integral part of the development of the Centre for Religion and Culture there, and together with a mutual friend of ours, Anthony Reddy. Thank you, Paul, for sparing the time to be with us today. Um, the, the presentation that Paul is going to share with us focuses on some research that he, he did um, over several years, particularly during and in relation to the role that faith-based organisations in the UK played during the COVID-19 pandemic and focusing on their impact and their contribution. So thank you, Paul, for sparing the time to be with us. After Paul has shared his thoughts and presentation with us, there'll be an opportunity for us to ask any questions or offer any reflections of our own. So if you've got any questions, perhaps they can be put down in the in the chat. And I will make sure that we respond to your questions if you're on Zoom, just as much as the questions in the room. And without any further ado, Welcome, Paul. Nice to see you. Okay, thank you very much, Chris, and hello, everybody uh, here online around the world, wherever you are at this time. Um, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, the presentation was originally meant to last for about an, an hour with half an hour's discussion. Um, I'm going to have to cut that down, I think, now out of respect for your uh, end time uh, at half past five. So I'll do my best to do it. A few years ago, when I first lent public speaking, in the middle of speaking very passionately about something, I stepped backwards and disappeared from view, and uh, I managed to get up again and carry on, and people said I got full marks for recovery, so I'll try to get some marks for recovery um, in this presentation. But anyway, so this project, ah, no, it's not clicking. Ah. More technical problems? Okay. So, uh, under the banner of uh, the Evangelical Alliance's Changing Church Survey, the coronavirus pandemic has proved to be a marathon, uh, not a sprint. And so what I'm going to try and do here is to project, uh, present a digest of some of the at least still provisional findings um, of work that I've done on the COVID-19 pandemic in Christian faith-based organisations, especially focusing on human financial and organisational contributions, but also the impact of COVID-19 in those realms on faith-based organisations, what might be learned from this. In doing it, I'll be trying to put things in the wider setting of the voluntary and community sector during the pandemic of other than Christian faith-based organisations. Um, and as we come clearer in the presentation, what I'm calling the wider Christian ecology uh, for Christian faith-based organisations within which they operate. So... I will be drawing on your feedback and questions, and also you'll be able to email me subsequently, and this will go up on the project website. Um, it, it will eventually go into a finalization of the project results, which will be in an extended uh, journal article of a, uh, 10 to 15,000 words, a lengthy one, but looking 
at trying to pull together all the evidence uh, that hopefully will come out in an open access journal um, in early 2024. So this is the project. Uh, the project link is there. And when you get the slides, you'll be able to follow lots of things off the links here. There's quite a lot will be presented on screen. I'm not asking you to read everything that comes up, but that's with a view to people who will access it in due course as a resource, because they'll be able to then follow up the links for themselves to access other further information that we won't cover today. Um, the project has been done uh, from the base, as Chris has already said, within the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations and within the Faith and Peaceful Relations um, interest group within that. And if you want to know more about those, again, off the eventual uh, uh, copy or get uh, access to on the website, you'll be able to follow those links. Um, I should acknowledge other contributors to the project at the very beginning, uh, Dr. Sanji Pereira, uh, contributed to its initial conceptualization. Uh, and then later, Dr. Bianca Slocum and Sophia Hasek, also from the center here, um, made contributions. And I'm grateful to them for those. So, the project origin. It was in a time of crisis. You can maybe remember everybody's running here, there, and everywhere. The COVID crisis inquiry is going on at the moment uh, in London every day. And in that context, um, there was a call for research to be done, uh, particularly the UK Research and Innovation Body funded, as you'll see, between 2020 and April of this year, 645 new projects and 529 ones doing something else, but which they repurposed. So there was a thirst for kind of knowledge. How do we deal with these things? What is it that's there? What can we do? A lot of those, of course, were to do with biomedical things, um, but many of them were also interdisciplinary in character, and some of them were rooted in the humanities and social sciences. And the British Academy, which is the body specifically for humanities and social science research, put out a special call, uh, COVID-19 programme. Uh, they had 842 applications and funded 56 projects, of which this was one of them. Many other projects took place, often organisations themselves wanting to work through and get advice on, consultancy on how they as an organisation might cope for themselves with the challenge of COVID-19. Nearly all of these projects at the beginning aimed for rapid research, what sometimes people call quick and dirty research. It's not perhaps the best phrase, but rapid research and dissemination of the results so that they could be used in real time because very often academic research proceeds at a more leisurely pace and eventually publications come out much later than when the work's been done. But the aim here was to get real-time interventions. And that was the original start of this project. Um, and it was originally planned to be based on an online survey of a sample of Christian uh, leaders, executives, service managers involved in Christian faith-based organizations in Britain, looking at those factors um, that were key to their operation that was meant to report nine months into from its starting in uh, 2020, August. Uh, so that was its time scale. University research ethics approval was secured and we made attempts to secure sufficient responses. But here is an honest thing. Sometimes research projects don't work in the way that you'd once hoped they would do. Now, I've been researching over 30, 40 years. Um, it's never quite happened like this to me before, but it did happen. And we could not secure, despite repeated attempts, sufficient uh, engagement with the uh, responses in terms of the initial form of the project. And that combined with then a number of personal and professional circumstance changes for me meant that it wasn't possible to do the project in the way as originally planned. We can speculate on that. Some of the issues were perhaps, uh, and here's a quote from one organization that did respond. I'm not sure how many others would bother given how busy we all are in the charity sector. I mean, it landed at precisely the time when the demand was so great upon many FBOs that actually to sit down and make a response was something perhaps that was too much. Having said that, there were other projects 
that happened and were successful in getting a large enough sample. But for whatever reason, ours wasn't. And as a result, um, I consulted with the British Academy to, in a sense, repurpose, refocus, adapt the project, like I'm now trying to adapt the presentation in the light of circumstances that come up and the route of your control. So it's become, rather than being a primary research project that would have had results from face-based organization surveys, a review of research and resources relevant to Christian face-based organizations now over a longer term period, um, looking at that and trying to draw lessons out of it, to digest from it, to make it available to people who, other than me, won't have necessarily the time and energy to read through the massive amount of materials uh, that's come out. Although it should be said, as I've noted at the bottom of this screen, that interestingly, there's very little research specifically focused on Christian faith-based organizations in the context of the pandemic, at least in Britain. Um, there's a lot more in America and in other parts of the world. But in Britain, therefore, much of what I've got here, I've had to derive from other wider research projects, looking at FBOs in general and or the voluntary sector in general, and extracting from that and deriving from that um, things that are pertinent specifically to Christian faith-based organizations. So, it, we have to acknowledge it was a real loss of potentially distinctive primary data that was not achieved through this project. But interestingly, beyond the pragmatics of adapting the project, having done this much wider engagement with the research and resource literature, in a way, out of that itself is foregrounded a key emergent finding that will kind of structure the rest of what I'm going to share with you. So. In describing and evaluating the contributions made by Christian faith-based organizations, the stresses and strains faced by them, and the ways forward open to them, one, it's generally helpful, not always, but generally helpful to understand them in the context of other FBOs, Jewish ones, Muslim ones, Sikh ones, Hindu ones, etc., and of the bro broader voluntary and community sector but not just generally helpful, but critically important. And this is, I think, the key thread that will run through what I'm trying to present about Christian FBOs in the context of the pandemic. Critically important to understand their work during the pandemic, their situation now, as well as their future prospects, as part of what I'm calling a wider Christian ecology from which they live and to which they also contribute. So ironically, not able to get the direct results specifically from the Christian faith-based organizations because the project as planned didn't work out like that. But the danger of that would have been looking at them in isolation and not appreciating the extent to which those kind of organizations are very much within this ecology. And that interaction um, is what can be learned from. So, um, definitions. Somebody earlier today sent me, yeah, what definition are you using about faith-based organizations? And like any good academic, hopefully, <laughs> um, the, the project was concerned with and the literature that I've looked at still is only being focused on Great Britain, so excluding Northern Ireland, England, Wales, and Scotland. And by Christian, it meant any traditions, movements, or groups in Britain self-identifying as such, not making any distinction between Trinitarian and non-Trinitarian, for those who know what that means. Um, based organizations, there's a whole realm of different definitions. A very interesting article there looks at those different definitions used in different contexts. Uh, so it's a contested terminology, a contested definition. The World Bank, for example, calls them entities dedicated to specific religious identities often including a social or moral component. We had a working definition of our own, which I've continued to apply, and that was as follows. Organizations with core values rooted explicitly in the Christian faith, where the organization's primary purpose is not evangelism, in other words, bringing people into Christianity, or discipleship, in other words, education and formation as Christians, 
but to meeting other service provision needs within, so it's also within and or beyond the Christian community, including but not limited to social, societal and individual needs. So yeah, a rather long um, definition, those who know me know that sometimes I get sentences too long with lots of brackets in between, but sometimes it's necessary for a definition. And I think it's reasonably justifiable in that case to show what we're looking at here. So within the overall picture um, of uh, voluntary and community organizations, this taken from the uh, Civil Society Almanac 2022 produced by the NCBO, um, you'll see that faith-based organizations in general, not specifically Christian, come in third place as the no total number of organizations in the voluntary and community sector out of 18 different subsectors that are listed down the left-hand side of the screen there. So they represent just over 10% of the whole voluntary and community sector. In terms of income, so the resource that they have to play with, with their work, they come further down the table, 18th place in terms of income in millions, only just over 5% of the income available to the whole sector. So they have a 10% place, but a 5% proportional income. Even in normal times, we know these faith-based organizations have played an important role in what the American social scientist Robert Putnam calls social capital, both the bonding, the bringing together kind, and the bridging kind. And they provided a wide spectrum of social welfare services. In the 2019 edition of the Almanac, there have been 15,000. So in between then and 2022, actually, over the period of the, uh, um, uh, uh, the pandemic, the total number of faith-based organizations has gone up. But, but the Almanac noted that the vast majority are micro and small, and it's still a lot of caution about the impact of the pandemic on the number and size of organizations. And a lot of evidence to suggest particularly small organizations become quite vulnerable during this time, which we'll come back to. In terms of overall resources that you can look at and follow through that I've drawn upon, and uh, you can draw your own digest out of what will be helpful for understanding, there's a mass of materials out there. So, um, on a global level, the World Health Organization has this massive database on coronavirus disease as a whole, but within that on faith-based activity. The Joint Initiative on Faith and Local Communities Multi-Faith Action, that also is a guidance document, it's called, but it's a so-called living document. In other words, from when it began, it expands massively, it's still expanding. You can still find many, many materials there from all around the world, not just in Britain, and the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs as a resource repository, again, with masses of materials in them. In the UK, specifically, in the voluntary and community sector, more generally, but including and covering Christian faith-based organizations on which I've also drawn, here are just a few examples. It includes one that we did um, here from Coventry with some other colleagues who are named there, on innovation and enterprise across the social economy in recovery from COVID-19. That was in the West Midlands uh, area. So you've got lots of different local ones like this, just a few examples here, but there were masses of these, a veritable, as I used the word earlier on in the slide, blizzard of research projects and of publications coming out of them during this time on which one has to work through to try to draw together uh, some things that might be learned. Um, there were also national surveys of a kind in relation to the voluntary community and social enterprise sector that were not just general, they were more themed. So looking at uh, the relationship of the pandemic and volunteering of voluntary sector organisations in the homelessness sector, looking at it in terms of Greenman, and very key and very importantly for a lot of FBO activity during this period um, in relation to the question of <coughs> sorry, uh, food vulnerability. 
during COVID-19. So also other more specialized and focused things, because we know that the pandemic impacted disproportionately on different groups, particularly in relation to ethnicity. And with ethnicity was a significant overlap in terms of uh, Britain's population profile, also in relation to uh, minority religious groups, but also minority ethnic groups within the Christian scene. And these were two of the big, uh, well, one of the big national report on that, and an example of a number of other local things that were done throughout the project. But then there was some also looking at on a multi-faith basis. Um, and right at the end here of this screen, I want to highlight two in particular that were very important and provide a lot of the um, focus behind this presentation. So the APPG, the All Party Parliamentary Group, that's a special kind of grouping in British parliaments, uh, drawing across both Lords and Commons and people of different parties on faith and society, did this very important project in 2020, keeping the faith, partnership between faith groups and local authorities. And then they did a follow-up, keeping the faith too, uh, which I'll come back to right at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Also, and I've skimmed through these very quickly, but just so you've got some sense and you'll be able to follow this up when you uh, visit the project website later, you can use these download links. It wasn't just Christian FBOs. So the Muslim Charities Forum, uh, Sikh research was going on into the Sikh community and so on. Uh, so there was a, a wide range of different things going on. But in relation specifically, to Christianity and the wider church focus research. Again, some big projects, examples of national projects there uh, conducted from the University of York. Many of these, and York and John were quite strongly Anglican focused in their engagement, uh, but not exclusively so. Uh, the last one from York and John had uh, also surveys focused on the Baptist and Catholic, and actually, I think some of the Orthodox uh, scene as well. Um, these two very obviously had a focus, again, in an Anglican sense on impact in relation to English cathedrals, but significantly, and a very important source, actually, the Evangelical Alliance had a changing church survey that's been a regular survey responding to the coronavirus crisis, which drew on a much wider range of denominational traditions and trajectories um, within the Christian team. Now, here we come briefly to Life on the Bread Line, which is a project that Chris Shannon, who chaired this meeting, uh, led from here. Why have I put that up at this point? Because one of the things that's become clear is the very large proportion of work done by Christian faith-based organizations in addressing poverty, and in particular, in addressing food poverty issues during uh, the pandemic. So to take an example, and here are only one or two illustrative examples as we go through now, because not having done the survey of FBOs, it's not possible to do results that can give you, oh, well, 20% of these and 80% of those. Here is a number of examples of things. So the Trussell Trust, very well known, national framework, sees itself as based upon Christian principles. Take a look at their screen there of report about how their work exponentially increased from the pre-pandemic year, 1920, um, up through the first year of the pandemic and then later on again. Now, interestingly, it's not only that it increased during that, but the column right on the right hand side shows the increase from five years ago. And why is that important and significant? It is because when one looks at the activities of Christian FBOs during the pandemic, and in particular in the sector of food poverty, one has to look at the wider socioeconomic context into which the pandemic came. That's to say, okay, the pandemic had these effects economically, socially on global supply chains, but it was already pre-existing effects of a decade of austerity. That's Chris's project and what that was all about. 
compounded by the effects of a Brexit-related trading constraints after the Brexit. Then and now, and coming into the post-pandemic phase, the inflationary effects of the invasion of Ukraine, and all of it accumulating into the cost of living crisis. So the extra work, in a sense, demanded of faith-based organizations and illustrated um, there by the Trussell Trust in the pandemic period has to be also seen within this wider curve going back behind that and going on after it. It's not just as an isolated thing. So I mentioned these two all parliamentary reports and this first one uh, did drew on research conducted by the Faith and Civil Society units at Goldsmiths, a uh, very important research and look uh, from the perspective particularly of local authorities about who they were working with during the period of the research in faith-based organization terms and in what areas they were working and interestingly again out of this project food banks came up as being that which was the largest proportion of activity that local authorities in the survey were engaging with across different uh, religion. So 59% of the local authorities responding to that uh, research were working with Christian related ones down to 1% with humanist related ones. But you can see again the very significant place and role of Christian FBOs during COVID in relation to food emergencies. And then what kind of food stuff was being done? Uh, at that time, again, from this work that the APPG uh, did, or that Goldsmiths did for the APPG, uh, different kinds of activity. And here, the different kinds of activity don't vary so much, interestingly, across uh, the faiths when looked at in general. So um, around transport and delivery of food parcels, 62% of local authorities working with Christian FBOs around that when taken across all faiths, that was 65%. Now, in particular faiths, it was rather less than in others, sometimes more, uh, but overall, that was a, a general picture where there was rough parallelism between uh, Christian FBOs and others. <laughs> However, what came out of this uh, was also, this report, uh, an emphasis that the capacity, although many organizations were in a frantic level of activity. The capacity for engagement, as it puts it here, perhaps not surprisingly declined across most areas of policy engagement. So in the past, researchers looked at FBOs working on a whole range of other things, um, loneliness, uh, mental health, debt relief, etc. And in the first phase of the pandemic, there was a major focus on food because of social isolation at the time. That was a major thing. So, you know, was it a response to increased demand or did it reflect diverting resources uh, from other kinds of activities that FBOs would have done prior to the pandemic? But what was precisely going on there? It's not 100% clear, but they're important questions. But certainly what is the case and this is not only for this research, but across uh, the board, faith groups and faith-based organizations were integral providers of new food distribution programs as a response to COVID-19. So corroborating evidence was also, I mentioned the Evangelical Alliances, Changing Church Survey, uh, involvement in delivery of food or medicine almost doubled to 50% compared with before uh, COVID. And at the same time, as in the APPG report, one sees that there were reductions in other kinds of activity in parallel to that. Some organisations operating on a national level, of course, were not only doing service work, but were trying on the basis of their service work, um, as, for example, done by Christian Action on Poverty, which does ongoing practical support work on poverty and debt, but they were also trying to make a case into the public realm to bring to bear their experience on the policy making that was going on at rapid speed and of which we have some not very good uh, reflections coming out in the COVID inquiry at the moment. But here we come to a kind of important point about all of this. 
which is that alongside all that activity and remembering that slide from the NCBO about the proportion of funding that uh, faith-based organizations have, 5% of the total sector relative to the 10% of organizations of the sector, this emerging sense of financial crisis, or at least a financial stress uh, coming down was being reported on in a number of different places. And again, uh, you can take from the Evangelical Alliance Changing Church Survey, 46% of churches saying donations down compared to pre-COVID. Scotland and Northern Ireland reporting the largest falls, 25% falls in donations. So this was a pattern going on in parallel with and alongside this increased activity. And what are the consequences of this? Well, is sadly one uh, example of that that actually impacted Christian Action on Poverty itself. So in January 23, the press release issued, you know, exceptionally challenging year, significant demand on services, calls to free debt load, helpline, et cetera, et cetera, everything rising substantially. But an update in February 23, following the review of staffing, we were making 50 head office redundancies over the course of spring. Our key priority has been to protect our front-facing debt advice roles where there'd be no compulsory redundancies. But you can see in that one example, and it's not an example alone, but it happens to be on a national level, of how this financial stress alongside this expansion in demand and activity uh, was going on. Interestingly, perhaps, for what I've said about the place of FBOs within a wider Christian ecology, um, what they said at the end of their press release there was, we continue to work hand in hand with our local church partners who provide face-to-face -face support for clients in their homes so they will experience as little impact as possible. So the FBO itself comes under financial stress, is forced to reduce some of its work, and certainly its staffing and its back office functions, but it manages to continue to provide services because it's part of this wider Christian ecology uh, within which it sits, uh, where its relationship to local congregations is key to what it actually can do. So it's not left, so to speak, high and dry when there are stress and strains on the FBOs because they're part of this wider ecology. What about volunteering, though, during this whole period? There's a lot of evidence. Of course, people say, well, there are thousands and millions of volunteers and, you know, do for the NHS. And, of course, there was this great sense of upsurge in people doing things for one another. But actually, uh, in terms of at least formal volunteering, the upsurge was in what the Council for Voluntary Services calls informal volunteering helping your neighbour out. In terms of formal volunteering, there was a decrease and quite a serious decrease in terms of people working through specific organisational forms to provide volunteering. The volunteering was this much more bottom-up generated. And there's a very interesting uh, article, A Bleeding Atlas, How the COVID-19 Pandemic Affected Volunteering in the UK. And again, one needs to set it within a wider period. Um, remember saying that uh, before the pandemic, in terms of food poverty and distress highlighted by the pandemic, it didn't just start there. Uh, there was 10 years of austerity before. And here, you know, between 2013 and 2020, when looked at in that longer time scale, again, formal volunteering was going down precisely at the time in a way that it was also needed um, during the uh, pandemic. So COVID and the ensuing recession have only exacerbated these problems by increasing the demand for services while reducing income and relying on a dwindling number of volunteers in terms of formal organizational sense. So what about this phrase that I've been using? It's a kind of a an artistic phrase. I need to do further work on it uh, before I publish around this, but setting 
all of this within a Christian ecology, a wider Christian ecology, in order to understand what was going on, what FBOs could do, and also when they were facing issues, how that related to the wider ecology. Um, there is actually a field of organizational ecology, ecology um, that tends to be rather statistical in its, in its work. Um, but ecosystems, and here's something from a, a, an academic body involved in doing ecosystem study, they call it the study of processes influencing the distribution and abundance of organisms, the interactions among organisms, the interactions between organisms, and the transformation of flux of energy and matter. Well, you might think, what's that got to do with Christian faith-based organization? Or you could place in place of those words what it is that binds together Christian faith-based organizations as specific entities and where they come from, they have their support in, uh, they have their accountability to, et cetera, and that interchange, that whole ecological environment uh, within which they live. And indeed, the University of York's um, project on COVID-19 churches and communities um, said here in its conclusions, churches have a proven capacity through what they call long-term networks and hubs of social care in every community. And interestingly, arguing it's not so much in that ecology churches, local churches or congregations, or even projects that were important and key, but what they identified as church networks. So again, that speaks to this sense of an ecology. It's a sense of network, of networking that goes also beyond and encompasses some of the formal links and liaisons between FBOs and people living and working in the Christian scene more broadly. So in our own uh, West Midlands uh, work here, we said, for example, uh, as part of our findings, alongside the contributions of specific faith-based organizations, wide faith communities and places of worship have a wealth of often locally rooted human resources that usually, though not always, have a readiness to provide volunteer help in meeting crisis needs. So what was interesting is that could be the case, and was the case often, that local congregations became a site of mobilization for a more general volunteering that was going on, not just support to FBOs or what the churches themselves were doing, um, but generated, you know, within that overall picture that acknowledges that formal volunteering was going down, nevertheless, from within congregations, this sense of providing volunteer help. This kind of, as I put it here, a kind of ecological connection between the relatively stable existence of faith community groups and places of worship. Of course, lots are also closing. So I say relatively stable. And FBOs, sustains FBOs. While faith groups and places of worship can flex into additional informal volunteering in times of crisis. People hear a sermon, get inspired, we have to do something. Or somebody speaks to them about their experience of working uh, down the street and what can I do? You know, so then the volunteering thing is flexed out of the congregation. Not that people are always doing it or will always do it, but that, that in times of crisis um, has come. But here, of course, we need to acknowledge that although that's a potential strength that was historically so during COVID, it is the case, you know, when you look at the numbers of congregations, churches, places of worship, you know, apart from in particular communities, namely very often uh, uh, African and Caribbean origin um, Christian groups, and in some of the so-called new churches, which are not often associated with buildings, those numbers of congregations are going up. But in terms of many of the traditional ones, they're going down all the time, closure, closure, closure. And if you look at the results of the 21 census, of course, uh, those self-identifying as Christians in that, in England and Wales, have taken a substantial dip since the last census. So what might have been the case here in the COVID pandemic, how long can that, in terms of Christian ecology, sustain itself into the future is an important question. 
And one of the things here that's often forgotten, and I put it as a footnote, but a bouncing one, so you paid some attention to it if you're looking at the screen. Um, local faith groups, congregations, and places of worship, they don't only do services outside, they are themselves part of the community. They're not as if they're something separate. So whatever work is done internally is also part of a service to society. And especially when one bears in mind the proportions of minority ethnic people within both Christian and particularly other faith-based groups. Um, and you know, this can often be quickly overlooked. I'm just going to say for sick for somebody who's kindly brought me a glass of water to sustain my voice for the last 10 minutes. So, when I uh, showed the first report from the APPG, this parliamentary group on faith and society, I'd said they'd had a second round two years later that was starting to look at longer term lessons to be learned and what might be implications for the future for Christians or for faith based organizations in general. So, I was extracting from it uh, information that related specifically to. Christian um, FBOs when reviewing this. Now, you'll note that you know, the early period, food-related partnerships were there right at the beginning and were dominant, but then expanded out into vaccinations. So many churches opened up to become community vaccination centres. You know, my friends in Germany, where I primarily live now, at first they, just, they couldn't believe this would be the case. Either the churches by have a vaccination program or that the NHS would operate it, you know, with nurses giving vaccinations in a church building. You know, it had to be done in the medicalized center with a doctor. And you know, so, but this was a very big part of an expansion, but also a change in focus. And what was starting to happen also alongside the change in focus, which also then went into mental health and well-being support, as some of the implications of lockdown became ever clearer, both on elderly people, isolated people, people midlife who'd lost jobs, and on young people and children who'd been not able to be in school environments, this focus of FBO activity shifted. But what was also happening is the chair of the APGG, uh, Stephen Timms, noted in the foreword to this report, faith groups were being more systematically involved in service provision. It's galvanized their sense of mission and purpose and strengthened their confidence. But authorities were not just using, if you like, faith-based organizations in time of crisis, in emergency, but out of the experience of co-working, were starting to systematically think through what might the implications be post-COVID. And also for the faith-based organizations. What does that mean for us in relation to our Christian ecology and our working with governance structures outside of that Christian ecology? So in this report were a couple of examples, um, Christian project leader in Southwest England, church-based health project, local health commissioning body, exploring whether they build a health center attached to the church so we can collaborate. Can they fund family support workers and locate them in GP surgeries? So much more kind of sense. Are there integrated possibilities that can emerge out of this experience and learning? A London uh, hub leader, Christian faith-based welfare hub leader, our approach is to create spaces of welcome that lead to the sharing of stories. Our philosophy is to be formed by people and not driven by projects. But a pilot local authority project and an innovative example they gave was the future delivery of key healthcare and welfare interventions steered by multidisciplinary networks, including faith groups, based on where people were already congregating in the course of their daily lives, which is also where some of the parts of this Christian ecology already were. So not waiting for services to go in some special building or environment that's abstracted from where people are, but bringing the services to where people are and where the wider Christian ecology can help that to take place. So, in conclusion, at this point, and this is where I will do 
um, further work before the publication uh, that I'm aiming for in early New Year. What comes out of all the, what comes out of all of this in terms of opportunities and challenges of what again the APPG research many people uh, interviewed in that talked about the opening up of what they called a new policy space and again here Stephen Timms the chair said it offers unparalleled opportunities for faith groups to be seen unapologetically for who they are i.e. communities of faith that faith-based identity for so long occluded, denied, or described only in proxy terms, such as culture or ethnicity, can now be allowed to express itself in fully authentic and creative ways. And some people then started, though, to make connections between that and what Danny Kruger MP, who was commissioned by former Prime Minister Boris Johnson to do a work on levelling up our communities and looked at the place of faith-based organizations within that, he spoke about having a new deal with faith communities. And there's the rub, or at least one of them, and the difficulty and the challenge that can face FBOs in the post-pandemic environment. Because the APPG noted in this increased working together with governance structures, there are concerns that are important. Is this starting to privilege faith communities? For example, as gatekeepers to the provision of certain services. And what might the implications of that be given that most faith communities in their organizational structure and leadership, perhaps not so much in the faith-based organizations, but in faith community uh, uh, groups and in places of worship are male orientated in terms of leadership? So what's the implications of that in terms, for example, of gendered aspects of service provision and so on. So it's not only a positive trajectory. It is that, OK, Christian FBOs have here and seem out of this whole experience to have identified the possibility for more co-working with structures of governance beyond this Christian ecology within which they live. But along with that comes this challenge of balancing the opportunity for better resources and wider reach of their services by connecting with government structures, uh, but balancing that with their freedom to be precisely faith-based organizations. And sometimes those which are not just focused on service, but also have a wider social justice concern that they want to press upon authorities as well as work with them. So I'll stop at that point and hope that I didn't speak too, too rapid fire in trying to get through that in 15, 20 minutes shorter than the original. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that really, really helpful and um, Lots and lots of questions, lots and lots of insights. Um, a kind of an unfinished story, sorry to me, a kind of a story that's still unfolding. Um, there are a number of people online. Um, it'd be good if we could make sure that we include people on Zoom in, in questions. So if you do have any questions, then please, could you jot those down in the chat? so that we can then um, we can read them out and uh, make sure everybody in the room hears them but whilst we're doing that um anybody anybody want to offer a thought or a reflection and um, or any ask for any questions about what you shared with us about the research Kristen? um thanks very much for 